Welcome everybody uh, to Parent University. We're going to talk tonight about evidence-based grading. Um, Dave, can you advance us to the next slide? My name is Joanna Borchert. I'm the Assistant Director of Curriculum and Instruction for RUSD. My colleague, Dave Benny, I will let him introduce himself and say hello so you can see his face. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is David Benny. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director of STEAM, as Joanna mentioned. And uh, we're super excited to have you tonight to uh, join us to learn a little bit more about our evidence-based grading system. Um, to start us off, I'd like to spend a little bit of time grounding us in some of the tenets of EBG, or evidence-based grading, and what the big draw for us from the curriculum instruction side of the house was to make the switch to this system from a traditional based system. So one of the, the big draws was this idea of student empowerment. Um, we really want to help build students that are self-reliant learners so they can go out into the world and, and be successful, whether that be through college or career. And EBG or evidence-based grading is rooted in putting the responsibility on students to produce evidence of their learning and understanding within a course. And then the teacher's job on the other side of the spectrum is to create opportunities for students to actually produce that evidence. The second big thing that we really liked about evidence-based grading was that it provided timely communication for both students and then parents as well. In an evidence-based grading system, uh, teachers are able to clearly communicate what skills, or if you're in an IB system, what criteria a student is struggling with or your child is struggling with and what they're doing, what areas they're doing well in. Um, the final piece that we really liked about it was that evidence-based grade grading focused on quality over quantity. Uh, teachers are charged with giving students opportunities to produce specific evidence towards course skills and content standards. And, uh, EBG or evidence-based grading relies on students consistently showing over and over again that they understand those core skills through a variety of topics or units that they study versus kind of a, a one and done burst of brilliance uh, that may happen in other types of grading systems. So those are some of the reasons that we wanted to switch um, over to an evidence-based grading system that really drew us into to this, um, this style of uh, assessing student performance. If we take a look at this slide, there were really um, three stories that we wanted our grade book to tell to not only students, but also you, the parents. Um, you may recall that uh, when you and I went to school, there were some teachers that were harder grader the graders than others. And you would try to get into the teacher's class that was a little bit easier and you might have an easier time passing the course. In an evidence-based grading system, uh, teachers are all using the same set, set of course criteria and success criteria. So we're all calibrated to what success or quote unquote good looks like. Um, the, the other piece is that the evidence your child produces in an evidence-based system um, through the assignments and activities in the classroom is compared to that uh, common course criteria. So grades are based upon that criteria within the course, and it's not um, so haphazardly put together. The beauty of having all of that common criteria within each discipline is that teachers are able to clearly articulate to your child and you where they stand in their learning journey. And this allows everyone involved, whether it be teachers, parents, students, counselors, um, to clearly understand how their child can improve and what areas they're doing well in. And so that kind of sums up these three stories in that we want common criteria in which a student is assessed against, grades that are based around the evidence a student provides, and the ability to clearly articulate where your child stands in their learning journey. So I'm gonna try to highlight each one of those stories a little bit. And in particular, we're looking at this story here, success in a course is calibrated to common criteria. Um, in an evidence-based grading system, we take a lot less emphasis on rote content knowledge, and we put a lot more emphasis around course skills. And in an evidence-based grading system, we had teams of teachers uh, identify high leverage skills that they uh, would be able to assess students around over and over again throughout the year. So some examples of skills that you may see on your child's report card would be argumentation or writing or performance or analysis or safety. 
these were all different types of skills and different disciplines that our, our content experts said, this is what's important. This is what we want kids to walk away with when the year ends. And there's a lot more emphasis around that skill development and a lot less emphasis around rote memorization of when uh, Columbus sailed across the ocean or, or fill in the blank for some um, specific piece of content knowledge. If we take a look at the second story, grades should be based on the evidence a student provides. The course skills and criteria attached for each of the skills and each unit provide a guide for teachers to create intentional learning opportunities for students so that they are able to then produce evidence of under, of, to demonstrate their understanding and mastery towards their learning. So one of the things that we have happening in an evidence-based grading system is there's this shift in responsibility from the teacher um, having to, to do everything in the classroom. And we're really putting the onus of learning um, on students, that they are the ones responsible for um, acquiring and demonstrating that they understand those course criteria and they can uh, show success in those. The final story is that we want educators to help our students see their strengths and opportunities to improve their weaknesses. Um, within each skill, there is a um, proficiency scale. And you can see an image of such a proficiency scale here. Um, most courses use a zero to four scale. Unless you're in an IB system, then you'll be using a zero through eight scale. A zero in an in really either scale indicates that your child didn't submit any evidence for an assignment. Whereas a one indicates that some evidence was submitted, but your, your child or the student is really missing the mark on what a teacher is looking for in terms of understanding of that content knowledge. A two typically indicates that a student um, has a general understanding of the content, but needs extra help or support. And then a three, is really like your, your, your kid's doing great. They understand the content, they're using the skill well, and they are, they're showing a lot of success. And a four is really going above and beyond what's expected. And so you can kind of see that crosswalk here of a four in an IB system would be a seven or eight, a three would be a six or a five, a two, a four, a three, and so forth. So um, in a nutshell, you as a parent, you're really looking for your child to hopefully get a lot of threes or fours in a normal or evidence-based grading system or in an IB system, uh, six through an eight. I'm going to find that mute button. I apologize. Um, at the high school level, we, we wrap up or we, we summarize student learning at the end of a semester. Um, so one of the shifts this year in our evidence-based grade books was to take those skills and apply a grade determination so that we, we know that students are going to earn fours and we wouldn't expect adults to earn four level work all day, all the time, in and out of every single skill. Um, so we did some research going into last or going into this school year. We researched last school year and um, use a grade determination for our high school courses that determines the student semester grade. So a student in a class at the high school level could have anywhere between two skills and five skills and how those skills shake out determines the semester grade. So you'll see the chart on screen where if a student achieves threes and fours in every skill for that course, they're going to end up with an A for that course for the semester. Um, when we get into the mid range, we have an overall score of any two for a single skill, threes and fours and all other skills would output a B um, and, and so on and so on. We really want to make sure that students aren't just kind of allowing some skills to overshadow others. So a good example of um, one of the reasons why we transitioned to this system um, is to make sure that students are proficient in all of those expected skills for a course and not just here or there. So that was one major shift um, in comparison to some different ways of calculating at the high school level in previous years. So just to give a couple examples, um, this was information pulled from um, a sample chemistry class. So we took uh, the four skills that were um, listed for a chem class. Thank you, Dave, for calling attention to those ones at the top. 
Um, so planning and carrying out investigations, um, data, developing models, engaging in arguments. So those are the four skills that science teacher said, we really need to develop these so that we know that our students are developing their scientific thinking and skills um, across content. So you'll see the, of many similar skills or the same skills in many cases um, across multiple classes. The difference being I'm going to demonstrate my knowledge of and skills within those skills um, in chemistry versus biology versus horticulture when the content is different. I still have to show you that I can use models, but I'm going to do that differently in a chemistry class and show that differently in a chemistry class than I would horticulture or biology or what have you. Um, so just a couple of examples of how that semester grade determination breaks down. So student one up at the top um, has a couple of twos spattered with threes because that student has those two twos in um, data and developing models. The output for that student's semester grade is a C. You'll see student three is another example where they've got a spattering or a combination of threes and fours. Um, that's proficient or above proficient in every one of those skills. So the output there is an A. A student two, however, has some work to do in terms of their develop and use of models. So that one really indicates to me as a parent or a counselor or another teacher that might be mentoring the student that there's work to do there. Um, and we'll get into some different views in a second in terms of, you know, what can I do to help my student? What can I do to help support and really get those skills up? Um, and that's one thing that you're going to hear us repeat throughout is one of the things to look for when you're in Infinite Campus and monitoring kind of the, your student's progress is any skill score of a one really indicates that there's work to do there. Um, one of the big benefits to an evidence-based system is when that one comes up, the grade will quickly change. Um, on the other side of things, if a skill score drops, that can drop a semester grade relatively quickly as well. So it's on both sides, um, but especially as we come to the close of a semester, that's one thing to really keep in mind is grade fluctuations both have positives and negatives. And at this point of a semester, um, it is possible for a student working with their teacher showing what they've learned now that we're coming to the end of a semester, um, that those grades can come up and they can come up quickly once a student demonstrates that they, they know what they need to know, they can demonstrate that skill through the content expected over the course of the course. So Dave is showing a, a sample of what you would see in Infinite Campus. So if you were to call up, this is a horticulture example. So another science example, another high school example, um, you'll see that planning and carrying out investigations is a skill that is also shared with chemistry. So a student taking chemistry this year was gonna continue to develop that skill of planning and carrying, invest carrying out investigations. They're just gonna do that through the lens of what they're learning content wise in horticulture um, with plants rather than with chemistry. Um, manipulating and analyzing and interpreting data, that skill score of one indicates to me as a student, as a parent, as a counselor, as a mentor teacher, that there's work to be done there. Um, so if I'm coming up to kind of a, a progress checkpoint, whether as a family or whether we're coming up to a grading window or whether a student simply just asks like, what can I do to make my grade better? That stands out to me as an area that really we need to dig in some more teacher and student and see where those speed bumps may have occurred. Um, develop and use of models, again, is a, a four. So the student seems to be doing very well with that particular skill. Um, but the output of that, again, calling attention to the right side of the screen, because of that one, the student's grade currently is a D. Again, that doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. That means that there's an urgent need there, that the student needs to reach out to the teacher and make sure that they know and understand what needs to be done to demonstrate their better understanding um, of that particular skill. And once that one comes up, their grade quickly changes. Um, Dave, can you do a click on that screen so we get our red box to show up? 
Um, we wanted to, to highlight or to point out that in Infinite Campus in the parent and student view, um, you see kind of three chunks of things. So what we have highlighted in red there, those are the academic skills. Those are the, the skills that contribute to the student's overall grade. Um, we're going to talk about growth and we're going to talk about those components what we're um, under the umbrella of professional skills in a little bit. Um, but everything above that growth grade is what is contributing to the student's academic grade. We tease out growth for a different purpose. We look at those professional skills for a different purpose. And I'm going to put a pin in that for just a minute because we're going to talk to or speak about that um, a little bit later in our presentation. Okay, so in um, Infinite Campus, you'll see three different categories in which an assignment can fall within. And uh, we use a sport analogy to help explain the categories within our evidence-based grading system. And the, the sports analogy is practice, scrimmage, and game. Um, so I'm just going to go through and kind of explain how each one is used and how they're, they're different from one another. Uh, practice activities are basically the, the building blocks of foundational knowledge within a class. Uh, if you think about this through the lens of sports, uh, you might think about shooting free throws or batting practice. In the classroom, practice activities are typically um, components or a piece of something that helps build towards a larger um, piece of the content or um, skill that you're working on within that unit. Um, the big thing to take away from this is that practice activities truly are practice in that they do not contribute to um, your child's overall grade. So they're very low or no stakes type of activities where um, students should be receiving a lot of feedback from their teacher. The second type of um, opportunity you'll see in a evidence-based grading system and within the gradebook is something called a scrimmage. And scrimmage activities are really what you think of when you uh, think of in terms of sports. A scrimmage is meant to mimic what the actual assessment or test will look like. So scrimmages give students an opportunity to really wrestle with the type of qu uh, questions and challenges that they will face once they actually come to the actual test. Um, the other beauty about scrimmages is not only does it prepare um, your child for the rigor that they're going to face when the assessment actually comes along, it allows the teacher to also provide uh, an opportunity to coach students and provide feedback on areas they're doing well and what they can improve upon. Uh, scrimmages also do not count towards a student's academic grade. The only category that actually does contribute to the grade is the game grade. And games, just like in sports, actually count uh, and they are the opportunity for students to show what they know and produce evidence that is then evaluated to the, the core skills that teachers found to be most high leverage and important and the criteria attached to those core skills. Dave, can you go back one slide real quick? Absolutely. Uh, Dave was talking, and I, I'm going to piggyback off of what he said. In terms of a, a classroom example that really resonates with me, um, is practice could be things like from thinking of an English class, could be spelling, could be grammar, um, could be sentence structure type practice that is an every day, once a day, you go through those things so they kind of become rote memory. Um, you have to be able to do those to write a paper, but we're going to practice that. We're going to learn the grammatical rules and all of those kinds of things so that if we are analyzing a text and writing a paper, that first draft of the paper or even a, a smaller portion of that, maybe it's just the first paragraph of that paper, might be something that a teacher uses as a scrimmage. It's giving feedback to the student about where they could improve certain elements and all building up to that final draft of the paper, which would be turned in for that game level kind of culmination um, of a grade. So if, if examples like that always help me kind of to put that in context, um, that's how we would build up to that game grade. Thanks, Dave. Well, thank you, Joanna. That was a great example. Um, so knowing that game grades can be farther between than the everyday putting in points that we all grew up kind of in that system. Um, one of our biggest takeaways, and this was actually from uh, some collaboration we were able to do with Stevenson High School in Illinois, 
was the idea of a growth category. Um, the growth category is not a contributing factor to a student's academic grade in middle school or high school, but is a great way to reflect upon the week prior. Um, so teachers input a growth grade weekly that is a reflection on the week before. So there's a lot of different factors that could go into a growth grade. We put that kind of generic scale down on the screen. Um, the idea being, when we start the learning process, there's going to be expected struggle. That doesn't mean that a student isn't growing. It doesn't mean that a student isn't going to get to proficiency. It just means it's new. So if I'm learning to ride a bike, I'm not going to be able to probably get on a unicycle and just take off the first time I've even seen a bicycle. Um, but knowing what a bicycle is, knowing its parts, knowing the end goal is to ride that two wheeler might be adequate growth for when I first experience or first see some kind of content. Um, minimal growth is a great way for a teacher to communicate that the student's performance is kind of making me nervous, right? Like they're um, their progress isn't what we would expect it to be. There might be some extra things that would benefit the student to do. Um, so minimal growth is kind of one of those indicators that like we're in between. I'm not having a panic moment yet, but there's work to be done. Um, that may be an opportunity for a student to reach out to say like, I really didn't get it. What else could I do? Or how else could it be presented so that we have that, that light bulb type moment? Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, failing to grow is a, an indicator that there's an urgent need, that something was going on um, that indicates the student isn't developing or isn't progressing the way that they should. Um, and there is an urgent need for the student and teacher to make a connection to make sure that they get caught up. There could be a lot of reasons for that. For example, if my student or if my child was out of school ill for a few days, um, and hadn't had the opportunity to connect with all of his or her teachers, I might see a failure to grow. That's concerning to me for a minute, but it's very possible that as my student then connects with those teachers and gets that learning back from when they were out sick, we go from failure to growth to adequate growth from one week to another. Um, so we're gonna talk about a little in a couple slides, like what are the indicators on the parent side um, that I really would look for. And I said a few slides ago, any skill score of a one indicates that there's an urgent need and any failure to grow also indicates that there's an urgent need. Um, and that kind of brings me to our, our takeaways of how do I support my child? This is a new system. This is a new way of doing things. Um, what do I look for as a parent to help support my students so that they can grow to their highest potential? And one is to utilize that growth grade. That's a weekly indicator of the week prior. Um, watch for any ones in a skill. That's another uh, can be very early indicator that there's some trouble and some work needs to be done. Um, we always advocate communicating with the student's teacher. Uh, again, going back though, especially as we you know, as students develop middle school and up into high school, that we want the ownness to be not without support, but we want the ownness of learning to really live with the student. Um, and hopefully this is a system that gets students to, to ask some questions. Why am I at a one? What else do I need to show or what else do I need to do to get from a one to a two? Um, and that conversation with the teacher should involve, you know, taking out those scales specific to the course and specific to the skill and saying, here's where you're at and here's what I need to see to get to the next level. Um, instead of, and I'm reflecting on my own education experience, right, going to a teacher and saying, why am I getting whatever that grade is? And then having a list of all of the things that either need to be done or need to be done better. Um, this, this system allows us to ask students potentially for additional evidence um, or maybe to retake or, or reprovide evidence of something that they've already done but needed revision um, to really show that they've built those skills specific to the course. Um, so I can't stress enough, the, the end goal is to empower our, our students to own their learning. Um, and again, not without support, but to really um, 
develop their own efficacy in, in their education.